absolutely thrilled. I'm not going to, I swear, I promise I'm not going to try to sell you anything or tell you anything about um, what we do at our organization because I, I truly am here um, to help every single one of you. And some of you may say, I don't need your help. Like, I'm the best networker ever. But we're going to start here with a little bit of a survey. So if you are, um, let me just talk about Barack Obama with you. If you are Barack Obama, you're a number 10 in networking. And if you um, literally don't know who lives next door to you, you're a number one. Is that, is that fair? So um, who here is a one to three? Self-assessment, like just quick. Like, like what do you think? OK, there's ones, OK. Um, what about a three to five? And what about um, five to seven? Okay. And then um, eight on up, eight to ten. Okay. All right. So this is a relatively um, not um, normal standard deviation. Normally, it would have been we wouldn't have had as many people in the I call it super networking category, and there would have been more self-identified people in the lower end where like I don't know anyone and I don't like introducing myself. So. I tell the story that, um, so my story, my personal story on networking and why I really believe that anyone can help be helped or has, can help themselves is um, I was at Northwestern as a senior and my dad had just finished paying off um, my brother's college. He was finished with university um, and my father's company went bankrupt and my father was a partner. Um, and had two more kids to go through college. And he had to figure out a way from going. He had worked for, for the same company since 1970. Um, so he finished um, undergrad, master's, PhD at Northwestern, classic engineer, uh, went to work for the, same, for the first guy who made him an offer. He'd been an intern for him, and then rose through the ranks to be president. And um, didn't even want to be president. He really just wanted to be an engineer, quite frankly. Um, and then had no network, zero. He knew people who liked him, he knew people who trusted him, he was highly ethical, but he had to go out and build a network of his own. I still am pretty much convinced that my dad has like eight people on his speed dial, that's it. But it was enough for him to figure out what he wanted to do. Um, over time, it took him about six months, and so he and his college roommate, um, from 1957 bought the company out of bankruptcy and that's what um, he ended up doing. But literally I remember my mother crying because my dad was in career transition, not sure how he was going to, and he was embarrassed. He was like, what am I gonna do? This is different. This is about people in involuntary transition, people in voluntary transition who just wanna leave. This is the best economy to leave your company and look for a job or look for a network, but it takes time and energy. So um, I'm gonna ask for a yes or no. Who would it um, believe me if I said that eight out of 10 executives have never tested the market outside of their um, existing, literally don't even call, uh, call recruiters back? One person believes me, two people. Oh no, wait, 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 more people are popping up their hands. Okay, so that is the statistic. We do independent research, we look at research that are done by competitors, by other organizations. Eight out of 10 people at the SLT and ELT level literally have it, don't know what's aware and spend less than 10% of their time networking external to their existing organization. And that's a really powerful number because that means you aren't aware of what else is out there. So some of my, oh, I have to go to the, um, who's clicking the best I only have three slides, you guys can really have to. Here we are, okay. So I, uh, this is a little bit, this, these slides clearly were put together more in job. Oh, please, go ahead. I just have a please. comment about that yeah. statistic. I, I, for me, I think, um, one, I was aware of that statistic, but two, when I was, uh, when I saw that statistic for the first time, it actually told me that how many folks that are in that uh, believe they know what's going on. Okay. So therefore, they don't in have to. In the 20% even, or the? In, in, the, in, in the, the smaller percentage that yeah. don't do anything, that don't do net, any networking. Okay. Or you said, your comment was they're not aware. I believe they feel like they are, and they don't need to do it. Okay, okay. That's my perspective. Okay, 
So you're saying in the first statistic, the people who d don't see themselves as good networkers don't need to network, and yeah. that's why they don't. Okay, that's yeah. actually a really a good insight. I hadn't, I hadn't looked at it from that lens, but that's, um, that's powerful. So if you're here and you're interested and you're engaged in this conversation, you may be thinking, I could learn something about networking, and I want to know what people are doing that would help me be um, more powerful. So um, my opening line is often, and I do a lot of speaking to student groups at Northwestern University of Chicago. I do a lot of speaking to women reentry strategies who are thinking about going back to work, um, or groups where people are sort of actively thinking. And what I hear is, um, Networking feels really uncomfortable because I want something from someone. And so I don't want to do it because it makes me feel uncomfortable. And what I'm suggesting is that the best time to create, develop, um, uh, really invest in a network is when you don't immediately need something from someone. And separately, along the way, when you are upfront that you want something, um, rather than being in a disingenuous manner, um, if, you know, let's get together, I haven't caught up in a while, and then you say, well, did I also tell you I'm in transition? That's not embarrassing, that's just life. But you need to be up front with people. So let's go to the first, uh, you know, this concept of what you can do. So who here, I know I'm asking a lot of questions, but it's important. Um, who here spends less than 10% of their time um, networking in this category of, I don't want something from someone? Okay, all right. And what about people who spend 20% of their time? And this is, we're gonna talk about what time actually means. 20% of available time. Weekends, evenings, breakfasts, that's those are pretty much. Or okay. Or socially getting together. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good point. So it's having a conversation about professional um, endeavors or professional interaction. So it's a little bit different than pure socialization, but that's a good um, dividing line. So discussing something about professional background. Did that change anyone's answer? Okay. So basically about three quarters of the group, half the group, spends a significant amount of their time meeting or networking. That's a pretty high statistic, by the way, FYI. Wait, please. Um, so, what is Phil? Phil, Phil yeah. please. I find I would have different answers depending on my current situation. So I am in transition now. Okay. If in I active answered, transition. Yes. Okay. If I answered your question six months ago, mm -hmm. right. I was yep. definitely in the group that was not spending much of time. any yeah. time networking. Okay. But now I would answer your question say where a lot of my time is spent networking, I'm not able to say, but it's just social, yep. passive, getting to know people, because now like, I'm on a mission to continue to meet people and try to network contacts into target companies. Okay. So I found that I was in the 10%, yep. um, maybe thought, based on the reputation and what you know, and not so much who you know, now I find since it was a long time since I had been in transition, it is who you know, and immediately then you're in a situation where you're trying to go soft and not be needy, but in fact, you need to meet people who could provide other valuable contacts. Yep. So, um, Phil's story, and I try to uh, make things interesting. So um, a decade ago, I was um, an executive at the Northern Trust Company. I had been there for 18 years. And I would have been in the category of people that had a one as their um, external network. Literally, I spent zero time talking to anyone because they weren't important to me and I wasn't interested and I had three kids and I didn't have time. And I would have told you that 10 of the 10,000 of the 12,000 internal people knew me on a first name basis. I was the uber northern person where I did everything related to northern. I went to every event. I had them over to my home. And so after leaving northern, and I had clients, so I had a broad client role and I saw clients all the time. That was different. It was still, I could do that as internal. Um, 
I had to develop a network. So I had to do what, and some of it was about figuring out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. This was before I was in the professional business of career transition and executive coaching, et cetera. And I felt all of the things that most people say. I don't have the time, I don't have the energy. People will think they want, people who know me personally will want, think I want something from them. I belong to clubs, they won't want to talk to me at the cocktail party. Um, none of that, I would tell you, if you ask someone, does this, I annoying? The answer is almost never. Some people are annoying. We're going to talk about those annoying people um, at the end of this and what not to do. I try not to focus on that. But if I could do it, and my I'm a little bit of an extrovert, but if my introverted dad could do it, I'm telling you anyone can do it. So now let's talk about the how, how you're going to do it. So let's start with, I literally have two slides. And the first slide <laughs> is um, using people's Thank you. Using people's time respectfully. So I could spend three days telling you about the disrespectful ways that people use your time. No show on the appointment. No follow up when they say they're going to follow up. Um, using your contacts in a, um, in a way that's not um, helpful. So you say to them, I have 15 minutes, I'll introduce you to someone, and instead they, in the first eight minutes, are gonna tell you about themselves continuously. I actually have a timer in my office, like a little timer, I use my iPhone now, but in the old days I had a real timer, where I'll say to someone, tell me a little bit about yourself, and then I'm listening for less than 5% of the people say, how much time do you have, or what type of overview do you want? Um, there's someone in the um, audience here, I don't want to necessarily call that person out, but had the perfect um, overview of what um, the person's background is. So if I ask you, tell me a little bit about yourself, how much time do you think I really want to hear on yourself? And I hope, two minutes, okay, any other 60 thoughts? Seconds. 60 seconds. I actually want three to five minutes. I want you to focus on your most recent history. Um, Less than half pe of people who contact me offer to send me something in advance. And I'm gonna read anything you send me in advance. It'll be while I'm on the elliptical, it'll be while I'm doing some like cooking. I'm, I will read anything anyone sends me. I'll glance at it, I'll read your resume. I'm not spending two hours looking at your resume, I'm just not. But on average, a person who you're networking with is gonna spend three to five minutes looking at whatever you send in advance. Sometimes often going to meet you in the, you know, there's glads again when they're going to get you from the entry. But does that make sense? Asking people how much time do you have to spend and not spending an hour? So that those are all categories of using time respectfully. And I'm still waiting for some people, who is this? Michael. Michael um, reached, to, reached out to me on LinkedIn. Like as soon as I'm done, I'm gonna accept his LinkedIn invite. Um, I don't link in with people who I don't know, who I haven't met at all. Um, and my contacts, I had to make them private. That's a long story. If we have time, we'll talk about that. But um, I will not accept invites, but I'll send every single person a note who says, um, and I knew that you were coming to this group, so I would see you. Eventually, you would have gotten a note from me saying, hey, let's speak on the phone. Um, percentage of people who I never hear back from. What do you think? 60? fish 70 percent never hear back from them like you reached out to me I sent you a personalized polite note in my own time in the evening or the mo early morning and you never responded it's crazy right that's another thing you'll never do okay so now let's go to making it easy for people to help you I already told you one thing sending something in advance telling people why you want to meet with them because some of these people may be people you know or you've heard of, but being direct mm -hmm. to your point on what you want is helpful. Probably about half the notes that I send are, I don't want anything from you. I just wanna meet you. I just wanna hear what your story is. I just wanna to talk to you. And that can be very powerful when you're not in career transition. Meeting people who you have something in common with, and you can find something in common with almost anyone, um, and, or asking a friend, 
to introduce you, but that's making it easy for people to help you. A personalized note directly to them. I sometimes do handwritten notes, I sometimes do electronic notes. I rarely call anyone on the phone anymore. I used to probably a long time ago. That's probably not as comfortable. Anyone disagreeing with me? I'm always open well, I to. I sort Please. Of, you know, I and what tell me, Kevin. Kevin? Thank you. I come from the mentality where you're going to make so much more progress when you're on the phone with somebody. I feel you're going to okay. you're going to you're just going to get so much deeper. Okay. You have to start it obviously with with either LinkedIn or an email. I was right? just, I was wondering about the initial, but yeah, I'm open you have to, to people. Start it with, but um, I just feel I just feel I kind of I'm kind of torn between the two sometimes okay. because I know you're going to make progress when you get on the phone with them. Okay. So typically, try to set up, hey, can I give you a call? Um, if you know them well, you can, if I know them better, I'll, I'll just give them a call, too. So any comments on that would be appreciated, I guess. So you, um, I was focused, but you've stolen some of mine, so you should come up here and just speak sure. with me. Um, because um, that's precisely right. I'm, I'm always torn between um, reaching out to someone on the phone, and now I've gotten to the point where I pretty much always use electronic or, again, written media first. But um, anyone who doesn't um, ask to meet in person, I'm surprised at. And at the end of the call or meeting, I'll say, you probably should have asked to meet in person because you get a more powerful impact and people remember you more. You're more memorable. But So I would agree with you that you should always ask to meet in person. Even if it's 15 minutes in person versus a half hour phone call, it's worth it. Okay. Because people will always give you a half hour. They just will once they meet with you. If there's no one who's that heavily scheduled, including CEOs, <laughs> we're giving people 15 minutes. It's just not. It's not. Um, um, so um, that is, and I'm not talking about the content of the conversation. I'm not trying to teach people who are successful and bright. If you want to, I can, but how to be a conversationalist. That's a whole separate genre of um, training and, and discussion and much more personalized. And so I'm, I'm, I don't spend any time on what to talk about once you meet. Um, so, and I feel, anyone here feel like they need help in learning how to talk to people? I'm sorry, you can tell what my point of view is, but anyone? No, I don't see anyone nodding their head, so we're not going to uh, talk about that. Uh, and then we're going to go into some of this stuff in detail. Being precise and detailed in your follow-up and delivering on the promises that you make. So if you tell me I'm going to send you so that we've had an initial call, you're going to send me an email that I tell you don't reply to the previous email trail, send me a new email so that I could just forward it more easily, at least 20, 25% of people still reply to the old email trip when they're sending it. And then I have to take the time to email you back. We discussed not doing that. Can you resend this? And there's a certain percentage of people who never even, 5%, just never hear back. Do you see what you're trying to do? You're trying to make it easy for me to take that email that we've, with your background, we've Somebody has, I've told you, say you've spoken to me, I've agreed to help you, and I refile all of those by um, subspecialty. So if it's a human resources contact, it's generalist, total rewards, uh, benef comp and ben, et cetera. If it's a finance professional, it's senior finance, junior finance. If it's a college intern, you can talk to how many people's kids need internships, it's college intern. It's just like, Sometimes I'm not doing it, my assistant's doing it, but do you know what I mean? We're taking all of those notes so that when someone asks me, even actually bizarrely, I seem to get asked, I don't know why, including yesterday, for exec admin, never contact me because I get so sick of people calling me about, like, do you know top-notch exec admin? I'm like, I'm not a search firm, so no, I'm not. Sometimes I do know them because they want to leave their evil boss, but um, and they've told me, they actually, I feel like you would believe how evil my boss is. I'm like, yeah, I knew you were evil boss. Um, but that's, I digress. But that is funny because exec admins seem to be the hottest commodity in this market. Kevin doesn't believe me. Kevin's like giving me this Aww. look of shock. Yeah, it's cool. I'm cool with that. Yeah, you're good. Um, and college interns. And if your child's a deadbeat, 
and you know who they are, do not send them to me to look for a college internship. I know who those people are too. Uh, deliver on your promises, we talk about that. And then communicating back, and this is one of my favorite parts. It doesn't have to be one and done. This isn't like one of those like dating things where like, oh, you never want to talk to the person again. This is so powerful. People who've met with you care. They want to know what you're up to. They want to know where you are, you know, if you switched jobs, if you've t taken a new role within your company, if you have joined a new organization that's really powerful. Don't solicit charity donations from them. That happens a lot, too. Um, but what you're doing is keeping people updated along the way without using your time. And this yeah, it's easy to do. You put your own name, I hope I'm not teaching, you put your own name in the CC, and then you put all your contacts in, you do it in one mass mailing. You don't have to do it in the BCC, don't, don't ever send. And then you can easily update people. It takes five minutes to write a compelling note on what you um, are up to. And I would suggest Christmas is a good time to do it. The Christmas card or the holiday card, if you're, a, I mean, I'm not a Christian, but I love Christmas. Um, so if you are using that, it's a great time to touch base with people, electronically or physically. And I send out, so this year I sent out, eh, it's like 380 Christmas cards. And a lot of them are people who I've known personally and professionally, or I've gotten to know, or are part of my network. I don't write those annoying Christmas notes on, um, like how perfect your family is and where you went to travel and all that like that's super annoying but i keep all of those and think someday i'm going to write one of these notes um, and but i do suggest that that's a great time to touch base with people professionally um, and tell them what you're up to please um and t remind me of karen karen thanks. i actually um for what it's worth started doing thanksgiving cards so smart because i like the idea that it's thank you so smart I, like the idea that it front runs all the holiday stuff. Very powerful. What I like you, that what it's you, not. I, I do hear what you said. Please. What, what Karen, you, um, say it again what you. Okay. I can repeat it. I, I started sending Thanksgiving cards, oh, Thanksgiving cards and Thanksgiving notes because it's Thanksgiving, everyone celebrates it. You front run all the holiday nice. stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, then, and then it's done and you can enjoy the holidays. Yeah. <laughs> and if people have time to get together over the holidays, yeah. you're yeah. So my family thinks I'm crazy, but my, oh, um, but go ahead, Alex, we'll talk about my family thinking yeah, I'm crazy uh, next. Would be a professional to send a bill to LinkedIn um, by the year, say, to your contacts or your connections, saying that this is what's going on in my life, or something like that, two sentence paragraphs. So a bra I dis no, it's not that it's too personal. I dislike LinkedIn as a mechanism for uh, communication because it's incredibly difficult for busy people to hear back. So if you're prioritizing, at least in my life, if you look at my two phones, I'm prioritizing text um, because someone wants something or there's someone who knows me personally and I want to respond to them, that's text. Then email, I scan for my um, associate first, then my colleagues, like I am five minutes literally between meetings. And so LinkedIn is the last priority for me. I do it in the evenings and the weekends or when I'm in a cab, like looking at it. And it's, it's annoying to be able, you can't get the back and forth. And you also, what I find is the worst is that you can't forward it, so I can't send it to my admin in order to be able to connect and I also can't forward it to others for action. So I love the touch point, and I don't think that that's too personal, the broad, but I think using the LinkedIn, and it's how hard is it to just spend one day of a weekend, one, and get all of you the emails of the LinkedIn contacts and put them into your own contact base. Not that hard, right? I mean, that's, and especially once you're caught up, then you can just do it routinely. I normally send people, some of you have probably received my email, hey, contact me on my um, corporate email. Because that way, it, when I forward it, it's gonna come from, or because my LinkedIn email is actually my personal email, and so I want people to be able to contact me through my BPI email. Make sense? But let's go back to um, Karen's. 
So I used to, before I had too many contacts and too many um, friends, I used to handwrite all of my um, uh, envelopes for my Christmas cards. Um, we have a different house, but I'm in August sitting at the beach or the pool, all of them. Like I would take them with me on holiday and then I would write all of them and then I'd bring it home and this was the look on my husband's face when I was doing this, like every year, so sick of me. So then I went to labels a year ago and I'm still sad that there, I have labels for the addresses, but it makes life a lot easier. So it's not as intensely personal, um, but I do that. And I drop them in the mail, so it's one of my husband and I, our favorite things to do. We walk to the post office, now we have to drive because I have too many, but I drop them in on Thanksgiving day. That's when my Christmas cards go out. And then you get that positive, people are like, oh, you're always the first. Yeah. Your adult children are so cute. I used to get better notes when they were little and they were cute, but now it's like, those are adults for Hila. Like, they're still super cute. Um, but so those are my kids and they get a picture. They don't get a picture of me. That's kind of weird when people are sending pictures of themselves. No one's laughing with me, no, trust me. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, but that's, a hu that's huge. And by the way, for women, and I only, if only women get a card from me, no man gets a Valentine's Day card, it's just not the way it works, but um, I have a Valentine's Day mailing for um, women who I know really well, personally and professionally, and that went out about four days ago. Papyrus cards, you know, a little note. So everyone has something, maybe a man can send a golf card. I mean, I play golf too, but you know what I mean. It's, uh, personalized, do you see everything that we're doing? It's creating a connection that's more than I want something from you. Or, um, and also if you promise to send me an article and if you promise to send me a recipe, if you promise to send me anything, send it to me. I want to read it. I want to hear it. You know, I, I remember from our conversation that you promised to send this to me. Um, so there's, so from yesterday's I had a meeting with somebody and they are doing um, they, aren't, they aren't using our firm. They chose a different firm. It was about a year ago, but a high potential um, talent development program. And they're doing part of it in Miami. And so the woman was telling me, um, the head of HR was like, oh, yeah, we're going to Miami. And, and I said, have you considered doing um, blank? It was a, an outing. It was my, when my family and I were in Miami. And she's like, oh, my God, that sounds so cool. So last night, just before dinner, I looked it up online. It's called The Walls of Wynwood. If anyone's ever been to Miami, it's like an art exhibit. And I sent it to her. And this morning I got an email saying, we've decided to do this. But do you see how that makes me different than someone who's like, oh yeah, too bad you didn't select us for your high potential program. And I also might get invited to be an observer now. I mean, do you see? It's like, it's just creating a connection. So let's, let's talk about, are we getting, Let's take a small break. Questions on this before. Karen, please. Um, the concept of time has okay. changed and seemingly compressed. So when you talk about following up and, and be sure people should be sure to send things, what's your expectation as the recipient of how timely people should be? Immediacy, end of day. Physically, um, um, I actually love handwritten notes, so um, getting those in the mail is different. But if it's something electronic, um, I expect it by the end of the day. And I tell this um, story that immediacy makes a difference. So the CEO who responds in five seconds to a email or a, he's the busiest guy in the world, or she, mostly, unfortunately. But, um, they are, um, the fact that they're able to do it the rest of us, we can make it happen. So um, here's, so my son was, I guess he would have been a senior in high school, and he went to an interview for a school that he really wanted to go to. And it's an in-person interview, it was Saturday. And the guy was gonna meet him at a coffee store in Evanston, and it wasn't Northwestern, it was just a different school. And the, um, he came back from the interview really excited, and I said, oh, send, send the thank you email. This is, okay. and he's like, Mom, I'm gonna take a nap, and he's a pretty good kid. I'm gonna get on that right away. I'm like, okay, um, I mean, I would have done it like right away when I got home. He woke up from his nap and came down with his phone, and the boy, man, who had interviewed him had already sent him a thank you note. Do you see how that makes you look like a B player? Because the other person, and when someone sends me 
a thank you note before I can send it. I actually send them a note bank back saying, shoot, I like I wanted to be the first person. I think that's really so immediacy does make an impression on people. It doesn't outperform. You have to be competent and you have to be right. communicative and you have to be kind, but it, it makes a difference. Um, and especially the people who say they're gonna send it and then they send it two weeks later. In two weeks the whole world has passed in my world. Like I'm by the end of the week, my whole week is, it's like, you have to keep it moving. So, good just question. To, uh, look, look, Please. Thank just you. Uh, it works. Underscore that point. It's not a huge deal, but I sent a LinkedIn invite to somebody okay. and put a personal note in there. Yep. And before I got to the next LinkedIn invite that I was going to send, they had already responded back and said thank you and, well, you know, nice meeting and so forth. And it was just, I was just like shocked, you know, because it, it was, it, it, now I remember that person. I know they're going to be available if I try to reach them. And it was just a nice reminder of what you just said. So, so most people who are, like if you've uh, met with me and I, um, your LinkedIn, I'm immediately, I'm just like accepting. Don't be rude. I didn't know you until today. <laughs> um, but I'm accepting them immediately, like as soon as it comes up on my iPhone, if it's someone I know. Agree. Yeah, it's important because you want people. I think LinkedIn is, sometimes I feel like I'm on LinkedIn, like they should pay me. Um, it's truly powerful. It's absolutely, everyone is using it, everyone, um, at all levels. Again, from college students on up to, um, I would say, I haven't done a formal survey, but probably 70, 65, 70% of CEOs who aren't old, don't ask me to define old, but you know what I'm talking about, um, are active LinkedIn users. And usually if you ask people what are your rules, it's usually, do I know the person? Like, have I actually made eye contact or spoken to the person? That's normally their role, too. Um, did you have any? That was very good. Anyone else? Questions, comments, observations? Is this what you thought you were going to get when you came to this breakfast? Or did you think, yes, people are that. OK. All right, key takeaways. We talked about this. Be upfront. Really be upfront about what you want. Um, Again, a lot of the stories that are negative, I'm going to avoid the person who sets up a meeting to talk about um, women's leadership and actually all they want is a donation to their charity. That's actually happened to me at least twice. Like, if you send me a solicitation, I probably would give you some money, but like, you can't use our meeting that we're meeting on to do that. That's, or you need to tell me, so be upfront. Um, if you need, Phil, to your point, where you're in active transition, so I'm the opposite. If you're in active transition, I'm going to make you a priority in my world and my life because that means you need more help or you need something and I want to move you through. Some people um, have a certain amount of time. One of my colleagues has a certain amount of time a day of the week that she spends just helping people pro bono. And same thing, you just need to tell people what you really want. And if you truly are just, um, your children are on the same soccer team, um, you probably have more su sports successful. I unfortunately never met anyone because none of my kids are good sports, but I hear that's a great way to meet people where your children are on the same team and you're, what, I need to go run some kids, right? Do you have any kids? That would be a good way. I got some for you. Oh, really? Oh, I, I need some. Um, never been to like a soccer game where you sat and talked to people on the sidelines. It's my dream. Dream lower here. Um, expand your network by asking everyone you have a legitimate connection with for someone else. If they like you, they know someone who you could meet. So last night at dinner, I was meeting one of my sorority sisters and one of someone who I know from the community I live in who were friends in college, but I never knew that they were friends. So we were having dinner, it was at six o'clock. And at the end of our dinner, I saw an old colleague of mine from Northern who we, we were both on women's leadership together. It was a long time ago. but So I went over and I've seen her occasionally. And she introduced me to two women who she was having dinner with, same restaurant, you know, just sitting there. And one of them sent me an email. So, so one of them says, do you have a card? Like, yes. And she, I would never have known this, but she is looking for um, advice on helping her negotiate an offer. I just went over there. She had already sent me an email when I opened my email this morning. And this was, I went to pretty much went to bed after the dinner, I did some other work. But so everyone can introduce you to someone. 
Does that make sense? It's like a good way. Now you can't do that every week and you can't do that every month, but you can do it pretty regularly. Everyone has ebbs and flows in their work. Summers are not as hectic um, this time. Vince and I had set this up. It's I'm maxed out every hour of the day, like every second. It's just, I have ebbs and flows, but you contact me in August, I'm pretty much gonna meet with you tomorrow. It's fine, I'll have time. Um, also, um, asking people when they like to meet. Sorry, I know this isn't on the slide, but um, I like um, asking people what's their preferred time to meet. And I keep track of it mentally, and I keep track of it in the notes section. Like if you're an early morning breakfast person, I know you, and I like you. If you like to have a drink, I'm never gonna see you, because like I don't like want to go out with anyone ever. So I'll say, oh, you know, nice, how about lunch? Lunch is good. Um, and these are lifelong skills. I really do believe this. It can help you when you're looking for board work later on, when you might want to join a not-for-profit board. Um, going to college, I used to be horrified by university alumni events, and then I chaired my 25th reunion, and now I actually look forward to it because it's actually a great way to meet people and to reconnect. Um, it takes a lot of work, but so, so what the switch for you? So for me, it was it was personalized connections. It wasn't just walking in and having you know 400 people who I don't know. So it's going to the organization and knowing 10 or 20 people who are going to be there. It's knowing the organizers. It's um, having some role in it. So um, at the University of Chicago, I speak every year to the um, all graduating the second years. Um, and it's coming up on April 6th. And so um, I look forward to it because the people who are, the, so I'm the keynote, the panelists are really interesting people. They aren't powerful or successful, but they have something interesting in a point of view, and I look forward to talking to them and reconnecting with them every year. And so it's, for me, really fun um, because there's something personal in it rather than a like speed networking, kind of, I'm just not interested in that. I want to have a, a more deep conversation with someone. Please, and what's your name? Janine Burrell. Janine, I'm, please. I'm, uh, I consider myself a super networker. Great. Kids hate me because okay. I'm, I, I'm on them about LinkedIn. Okay, okay. So, um, funny story. So please. So I'm, I'm, I'm on an airplane with my son. We, and how old is this son? He is 23 years okay. old. Okay. So for whatever reason, I'm, I'm destined to sit next to this and we switch seats for whatever reason. I don't know if it's because he wants a window or whatever. So he sits down and, and I'm in the seat uh, in front of him. So a, as I'm listening, they're talking, they, they are like having like a conversation, like an hour long conversation about skiing in the Alps and this trip and that trip and what they share in common. And I'm like, oh my God, he's gonna get it. He's gonna get a name. And I'm like, yes. So, cause I always get names on here. So I get off the airplane and I'm like, so I'm like, did you get his name? Yeah. And he's like, and, and I hear my husband tell me, oh yeah, that was blah, blah, blah. He's the weatherman for Channel 7 cool News. I can't yeah. remember the guy's name. Um, okay. See, I didn't get a card. So, okay. But he was he's really, he's been a weatherman there forever. Uh -huh. Channel 7 News. I'm like, so cool. what's happening? You've got to get his name, get his card. He's like, what is that guy over there? It's not what he can do for you. It's if you it's make a connection, it's what his friends your can do for you. Okay, uh, so there's so many. I love, I love. I, we're gonna talk later on. So um, I uh, there's so many things I can bring up for this conversation, but let's just bring up a few because we have like a couple of minutes. The first one is that this morning on the radio driving here was a, um, a like you know the the radio host was talking about. Did you know that Delta Airlines started this napkin? Um, you already know about this, so you probably listened to the same thing I did. That um, where you could give someone your phone number written on a napkin, it said, and then after an outcry of like outrage, they stopped it. Apparently, a lot of people meet people on planes. So I, I'm listening to this horrified because I've spent 25 years traveling continuously on business, globally, nationally, and 
I don't speak to anyone on the plane, <laughs> ever, like ever. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want you to know what my business is. That's the one place in my life that I, because you're, then you're going to be stuck next to the person for a long time. So the funny story related to that is about 10 or 15, it was a long time ago, I was younger, um, a man, um, an older man sitting next to me um, says, do you have a pen? And I'm like, oh, it's starting. I'm like, here's your pen. Um, okay, and then I like make no eye contact. And then he's like, do you have a piece of paper? <laughs> Why me? Okay, here's your paper. And then he says, um, and I'm half Pakistani, and he says, where are those, these bracelets? I've worn them since I was in high school, these two middle ones. Where are those bracelets from? And literally every iota of me was like, I'm, not, I'm just gonna say to him, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you, I'm very busy. Um, and instead I said, well, you know, I was giving them from my mom, they're from my mom's wedding. And he says, my daughter-in-law is Pakistani. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really care, but okay. Um, <laughs> it turns out his daughter-in-law is my parents' best friend's daughter. <laughs> and I was at the wedding. And so I call my parents as soon as I get off the flight, I end up talking to him. I know that his wife has just died. I'm like, I know your wife is, I'm so sorry for your loss. My parents told me. I tell my mom, and my mom says to me, were you rude to him? <laughs> I wasn't rude to him. I was super nice to him. I was thinking about being rude to him, but I wasn't. And so after that, I'm more just really neutral on the plane. But the plane is just sort of my spot. So I was coming back in June from, on a business trip from Frankfurt, and it was a day trip. So I had gone for a dinner. I was coming back. I was writing all these notes, handwritten thank you notes. And the man next to me, who was sort of you know, far away because it was you know international flight, says to me, you have a lot of notes um, to write. Who are you writing those notes to? So I put my headset on, and I didn't respond. Like, <laughs> we're not friends, and we have five more hours left on this flight, so I'm not talking to you. But anyway, there's so many things about the plane. Um, I could go on for an hour about plane um, stories. But so the first hour, I thought he was going to ask you for your phone number. Yeah, no, no, no. I have enough wedding rings on that no one's going to ask me for my phone number. But um, Chris, I could talk about plane. One last plane story, please. So we're coming back. Uh, no, we're not coming back. We're going, actually, to L.A. I don't know why I just said coming back. My husband and I and two of our, and our girls, our son wasn't with us. He was flying directly there. And um, my husband is very, very tall, but we always, I'm a huge believer in flying coach. It's just my thing, unless you're flying globally. I just really believe it builds character. There's so many things that I love about it. So my husband and I, and he's like, and our girls who are tall are sitting in first class, and I'm like happily in coach, I'm like getting the free coffee, whatever. <laughs> and my daughter says, I'm sitting next to Ice Cube. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> what, what do you mean? She texts me. And I said to my husband, look, and my husband says something that's, he's like, he's probably dangerous. I'm like, no, he's, just because he's a rap star does not mean, she sends a picture of them together. And um, then this dangerous person, Ice Cube, who seems to be famous, invites my 21-year-old daughter to a party in L.A. <laughs> and I'm thinking, if you hadn't spoken to the person next to you, this wouldn't have happened, Right. <laughs> that just happened. I was kind of mad about the whole thing. But he didn't invite me to a party. I just want you to know. No parties. Um, okay, let's keep moving. Help other people in the same position. So, um, anyone who's been in active transition, I've been in active transition, you're going to respond immediately to people who ask for help. And after 2008, do you know anyone who has a, doesn't know someone who's been in transition? Anyone? You'd, you'd have to live under a stone to not know someone. So, People who've been in transition themselves, whether they've left the company voluntarily, involuntarily, are so helpful because they care a little more and they're going to respond. And so you're gonna be the same way. It doesn't matter if you've networked and you've seen the benefit, try to be just a little more responsive. Find an extra hour for that breakfast. Maybe a Starbucks, maybe at the soccer field, a, um, a conversation. That, that concept of paying it forward actually works, and it's, it just can be so powerful. So that's what I like to close with before we, um, Priya. I have a question about pride. Pride, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so like Phil, I was not taking calls from recruiters a year ago because I was super busy and I was down, and had a lot of really good interest from other recruiters and actually had a 
the job offer, and it was a great company, and I politely said, maybe not politely, I said, no, thank you, I'm going to do this other great thing that okay. ended up not being so great, right. right? So now I'm at the point where I, do I reach out back to those people? Like, and it's it's a little, that's where the pride piece comes in, because they're probably slighted, like, oh, well, she found something better. So I get, what's your take on so, how to reach back to people that may offer you a bridge and you turn it down? So you're playing that tape in your mind that that person, that person probably has forgotten you and okay. has probably um, not. What you do want to do if you, um, there's two situations that I would say are the are different. So if you um, reneged on an offer where you accepted it and a search firm has been involved, you're dead to them. Okay. They're going to be angry. Um, and unless you addressed it in the, um, in the moment, they're probably really mad at you and they have a long, long memory for that. So that's the only exception that I would say to that rule. But if there was a discomfort or you felt that they, um, that there was any kind of um, issue, I would acknowledge it up front. A year ago, I was, so I would be saying, a year ago I was in a different place and I didn't take the opportunity or didn't, um, really invest in a conversation with you and I'm hoping that that bridge is still open and what would you be able to um, meet with me so I would just acknowledge it if it truly it's probably 60 70 yeah. percent just in your mind right. and no one even um, remembers so but I would go back to every single one of those people because they're probably already you're probably already linked in with them yeah. they probably have some form if it's a search for them they have you in their database already um, Aiden please yeah so a couple things that I'm yeah. gonna I really want to double down on that fourth point. And that's the way I kind of look at that is be prepared to give. Um, I think too often we want to take what we're not willing to give. And I think that's a big part of networking is showing up. And it, and it kind of goes to another point of it's, it's one thing to show up, but there's another thing about how you show up. And it's got to be authentic, it's got to be real uh, and genuine. You're going to be uh, networking really smart, talented people. And if you don't pass what I like to call the SNP test, it's not going to fly. So um, just be prepared to give. Um, to your question about recruiters, I find them more engaging when you already know what they need <coughs> for a living. And they've got a lot on their plate trying to fill a lot of roles. Um, that's what they do. And so I offer my network to them. Say, well, you know, how can I, I want to learn what's on your plate. How can I help you take take some of what you're looking at? What roles are you working on? What are you looking for in talent? And that usually gets them engaging in conversation uh, versus, hey, here's what I'm looking for. No, I want to help you. <clears throat> I need, but I need to learn what you're working on before I can help you. So that would be an approach that I would, I would encourage you maybe to consider. Um, and then one last comment. You know, we've all heard the saying six degrees of separation. I think we live in a world where it's one or two degrees, quite frankly. And uh, for me, relationships are everything. And so my father would always tell me, be careful on the toes you step on, because it may be connected to the rear end, mm -hmm. use a different word, uh, mm -hmm. that you have to answer to in the future. Uh, and I've always kept that in my mind, regardless of who I meet for the first time, or who I retain relationships with, because it's so true. Um, your example on the plane, turns out to be your parents' best friend. Literally. The plane is the only place I'm not engaging <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. um, That's um, fair. Wait, Phil, did you have something related I, to Aiden's? I did. Go I ahead. ahead. You said it at the time, so I'm not trying to open this no, up to something different. But it was in my head when I was briefly describing what it's like to be one of the 10% of people who never spent any time that working. This notion of giving and taking becomes a challenging element as well that Usually there's an introductory email that I make contact and I'll go and meet someone. So what can we do for each other? And I'm in that unfortunate position because I wasn't building a network. I don't have a virtual Rolodex of people who I can think through and suggest. I've got these great cultivated contacts I can share with you that you may find them very helpful. It's more going and I'm open, I'm, I'm in the moment, I'm listening share empathy and we can talk about what we've been experiencing that's been working or not working but I don't have that 
giving me, it's like, I'm coming because I want to be up front and hear you saying and ask what I need. I'm, I'm hopeful that you can provide or suggest some names of people who might be helpful. Here's what my search looks like. I, I so you've already been up front. I mean, I'm mean, i up front, but I, I can't communicate <coughs> when But you're being up front about that. And, and you're creating this. Um, wait, once you're creating this um, database for the future of ways to help. Does that make sense, Aiden? Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, there's different ways to give. You don't have to necessarily give a name or a number. The way you show up, showing empathy is, is a form of giving. Showing the ability to share your story is a, is a gift, in my opinion. That's a gift. See, there's a lot of different ways you can give to somebody without saying, "Oh." I, Talk, call this guy. He can help you. It's just a matter of how you want to present yourself and, and show up. Um, I think you're maybe doing a little disservice to your own s set of skills um, and the way you the way you present yourself to people. Um, but that's just a thought. Okay, we've got it first. Um, so my name is Paul. So I kind of take that perspective. And Jim and I met about two weeks ago, and then we sat down and had coffee yesterday. Okay. And one of the things he said to me is, "I, I, I can't offer you." Anything. He's okay. doing the search, I've been through it before. Yeah. I said, I view it as this overall circle of karma or yep. helping as a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. I can give you my experience and my knowledge today. I don't expect anything from you because there's going to be somebody, and there have been hundreds of people who I couldn't give anything to have helped me. Yep. So that you shouldn't feel guilty about it. You should just sit down and give what you can and take what you can. That's it. Uh, that's. that's, that's really that is um, so powerful that you had, that you're saying, that, but you need to be upfront with people. That that's and that's what I love about this. This to use your your word authentic, Martina, and then Aiden. But didn't I say that to you yesterday? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just reinforcing. We believed him. We believed him when he said it anyway. We, we didn't need the, You seem trustworthy. <laughs> yeah. My dad said, "Blessed is the man with three daughters." That's what he says. Go ahead, Martina. Keeping something back where I'm saying I'm involved with uh, Money Smart League. So, what for somebody having children say, right now? Or say it one more time. My Money Smart, money smart Ways. Yeah, okay. It's yeah. sponsored by Federal Reserve Bank mm -hmm. on one of Money yep. Smart League partners for quite some years. For anybody knowing you, sixth grade through eighth grade, there's currently a essay competition open, 300 words required. The first winner gets $3,000. And gets uh, for scholarships. So if there's somebody of interest, that's what people were talking about. Having you, I'm involved with. I can just hmm. share right now. And it's right, financial. Well, we can talk about this. Maybe you could share it's some financial information. empowerment so, yeah. between this year, April, March 30th through April 6, 2000, yeah, yeah. 2019. Not and only here in Illinois, but nationwide. It's moneysmartbeat.org. And you can, and this has been uh, nationally published because I, um, I was quoted on something for a, somebody who, you know, didn't grow up with a lot of money, like how I built financial savvy. And Melody Hobson is also doing a lot of work on financial empowerment for um, young women. Have you seen a lot of her work with Ariel? They do a lot of research yes. on, um, on how women manage their own um, money. And actually, we could talk about this later. Wait, Aiden, did you have and then oh. we're gonna, No. My I always tell everybody knows somebody you don't know. But when you say you don't know anybody, your next door neighbor, your cousin works somewhere, everybody knows. And, and not, when you meet somebody, everybody gets emails about networking groups. You can always forward those to people. Like, you can share. Exactly. You know, like FEI is a great place to get involved in. I mean, when you're working and you're not working, but you can't, you have to stay involved because it's an ongoing thing. But I joined FEI 20 years ago and been a long time member and it's, meet great people, you meet I'm going to quote speak, you now. great speakers, and it's, uh, it's all about knowing Everyone yourself. Everyone knows it's everybody, or someone. Everyone yeah. knows someone. It's absolutely. And I was going to say, you needed to add a takeaway there, and that's take advantage of the outstanding network opportunities that you have by becoming a member of FEI. There, there are literally, literally hundreds of people available for everybody to meet at our dinner meetings, Sessions like this, and not only the members, but the guests, the sponsors, the speakers. There's a multiple opportunities to build a network, and it's it's all available to you right there. 
by being a member. There you go. Well, and I, I would, I would counter what Richard's saying. I mean, in FBI, if you, if I've heard in the ten years I've been a member, yeah. Well, I, I don't network. I don't have a network. Okay. I don't know how to network. Yep. Well, you start and like yeah. you start with a small group like this, and. I always like to tell people with CMG we don't let we don't permit any wallflowers. So if somebody's a guest yeah. and they're just kind of floundering, they get pulled into a conversation yeah. here. Exactly. But then once you start getting comfortable, then you graduate to the next. Then you go to a dinner meeting with 200 people there. Then you become right? president like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not the president. I'm just, yeah. just a, I'm just a worker. Okay. Please, Karen. Is there anything on your list of things we should not do that you haven't already worked in your office? Yes. Um, um, I would, yes. So stalking. Stalking is never okay. And stalking can be defined differently. Like you can stalk me a little and I'm like fine with it. it you cannot contact people more than once a week. It is unacceptable. So you, and you cannot use um, phone, email, um, LinkedIn, um, all in sequence in, immediately in order to get, you, you need to give it a little bit of time. So that's what I would say is a one like unacceptable thing. Um, the second thing that I would say is unacceptable is, and this is so complicated. So I met someone through an organization like FEI that I'm involved in, very involved with. I run a mentoring group, love it. And there was a person who um, was a woman also for, from the investment business. So I have you know passion for the you know, women who are making it in the investment management business. I, I met with her a couple times. And then she explained to me about six months ago um, that she was charging people for introductions to other people. And I was beyond horrified by this, like, like just horrified. And I said to her, so if I have this straight, maybe I'm just a little slow today, you are running a business where you use contacts and then you sell them to people who you're charging? She's like, yeah, yeah, no, no. So I explained to her that it seemed unethical and I was uncomfortable with it and I immediately on LinkedIn like blocked her. I've never blocked anyone on LinkedIn, ever. I, I literally, even now you can tell like, it's like, how does that even work where you think that's Okay, it's not okay. I mean, how would no? So that would be another unacceptable networking thing. Charging people. Go ahead. Back to Please. stalking. Yes, stalking. Uh, how many times? Uh, what is the limit of stalking? For instance, uh, if I sent out LinkedIn messages to to people okay. and haven't responded, and okay. haven't get through, received a response back. Okay. Uh, twice already. Okay. Is, third time, another one, or a third message? I would try a different Is technique. <laughs> I would send a handwritten note um, if it's someone who you really want to meet or someone who you have a connection to or someone has recommended. I would send them to their place of business um, a note saying, this is the reason I sent you a LinkedIn invitation. Um, does everyone here have, on your in, tra in transition, do you have a business card? Yeah. Okay, so you have a personal business card. I would put that in. Normally you'll get some type of response from that. Does that make sense? Um, but I would definitely say three times in a six month period seems um, fine, or twice, so once another week, and then give it another month. You know, don't do it every single sequential week. I know the people who are trying to sell me something, they send me something every Thursday morning. I know, that's different. But people, Aiden, what's your standard of excellence on this? Well, that's, I mean, the comments are good, I kind of like it. Um, I don't know if you've done this, but I, I always try to encourage people to, and it gets back to my curiosity, being very curious, get really good at asking really good questions. Mm -hmm. From, the, from a, a human, just as humans, we're, we are geared, we have to answer a question. That's just the way our minds are. So if you're really good at asking really good questions, especially to senior leadership, uh, either around their business, around something, they're gonna have, we have to respond to that question. So I would just get really good at asking really good questions, because all you want is, start, is to engage a conversation. You don't necessarily need to meet them right away. But once you start getting that conversation, eventually, if they're really good questions, stop provoking open-ended, clarifying questions, you're gonna get more people wanting to engage with you. And it's gonna be more fulfilling conversation, in my opinion, because you're learning. 
right? You're learning about what's going on in the world. They're gathering more information about you, and that over time, the comfort level is going to get stronger and stronger. And eventually, yeah, I'm going to copy you. I can give you examples of that, but that's just my point. That's I think he's um, talking about just in the initial outreach, right? In the initial. Well, even then, yeah. even then, though. Yeah, Great well, question. Starting out with a question, uh, even after a brief introduction, just say, I'm curious about this. I've read this article impacting your industry. How are you doing? How are you addressing this to your company? So something engaging is my point. So this is my uh, for instance. Yeah. And maybe you guys, I'd like to know your uh, opinion if I lean too forward. So uh, I, I reached out to targeted like uh, um, several firms, about maybe 20 firms mm -hmm. that are in my specific industry, which is very specific. And um, I reached out to either like a CFO level or a CEO level, um, each one requesting and set the LinkedIn invite and also message them that I'd like to introduce myself by you know, like a quick background, you know, just I've been in the industry for X amount of years and I'd like to uh, explore potential opportunities with your firm. One is that too forward, and the other part of that is most of the people accepted the invite but never responded to my mm -hmm. message. Not surprising then. Yeah. Yep. Um, so quick question. Um, I feel like we focused a little bit on um, more senior people. By the way, I'm just as likely to go to literally the secretary's baby shower as I am to go to the CEO's birthday party because everyone can be helpful. And if you care about people, there's a reason that you have a personal connection with them and those interesting, you can meet people in all walks of life that are the most fascinating people and so never just focus on the more senior people. They're busier. They have less desire to invest. They usually have people who are doing that for them, who are sort of screening talent. But you might do better reaching out to, I don't know if you went to you know, DePaul, to the Career Resource Center and finding someone in the finance organization who might give you insight on something that, they're challenged, that they have a challenge with. They might be doing an implementation. They might be doing a, um, a Six Sigma present, you just won't know, and so you'll be even better prepared when you do get in front of the more senior people. Does that resonate? Maybe. Yeah, it's just information. Um, did you have something in the back row? No? All right. No. Martina? Did you? I just have one quick question. How you, what do you recommend or others do if you get contact by somebody who says they're a recruiter mm -hmm. reaching out to you, want to connect? And you never hear back from them. Are they? An, are you an active or a passive transition, or just sort of networking? Um, I'll do active. Okay. Okay. So I would um, ask them if they were interested, and if they don't respond, I'd move on. If they contact you and they're that bad at follow up, and they're that bad at um, communication, you're probably not very effective at their job. So my question was, do you think this might be a true human, or does it, because there's so many uh, but, yeah. right virtual, now, right? Et cetera, artificial yeah. Contacts that um, it might be, but most search firms are set up in a very hierarchical way, and so they usually have lower level people who are reaching out on behalf of them. They usually have a team of people. So, like the guy who does CMO searches at Spencer Stewart, you practically have to be got to get in front of him. I mean, I, I but does, does that make sense? And yet. This is the person who you do want to eventually connect with if you're in the marketing space, and he's brilliant, but he's going to have people screening, to your point, for him. So, but I would, I would respond. If you, can, you can Google people, you know, you can look at, figure out if they're on the search firm website or whatever who they are, um, but they may be just their research group. Um, and then the last thing is, so everyone in this room, there's someone who has less of a network than you, literally. Someone who's maybe grew up in an economically disadvantaged family, maybe someone who's new to the workforce. Um, every year, and I wait for the Northwestern Career Resource Center to send me, I work with two people who um, literally have no network. Um, that literally none. They know no one. They may be first gen uh, college students. They may be um, full scholarship. Usually it's all of the above full scholarship um, recipients and they have no network. And they're up against people whose 
um, have been, they call them referrals in our business, the CEO's children, you know, go out. I mean, I always know what a referral looks like because I see them all day long. And it's exciting, happy to help everyone. But, and I would um, just encourage every single one of you to help someone like that. Someone helped me when I was young. I didn't even know anyone who was an investment banker, literally, not one. And that's the way in which you also see it through the lens of someone who's less um, advantaged than we are. Fortunate is good, whoever used that word, um, than every single person in this room. So, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.